Hi kids, how you doing? My name is Jordan Joquil. We're here on Haleakala Ranch. It's a beautiful place you can see up on the mountains. Um, I am a land manager on the ranch at Haleakala Ranch. And so we do a lot more on the ranch besides just raise cows. We have to manage land for those cows. And so what that means is managing for invasive species, managing for native watershed forests, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and also planting koa trees, because koa trees are also a really important crop uh, and an important resource for our important, an important thing here in Hawaii. I think you're all familiar with koa trees and koa canoes. So one of the most important things we do here on the ranch, and me as I do as a land manager, is I protect water. So why is water important? We use water for everything we do. We have to drink water every single day of our lives. Most of our body, believe it or not, is made up of water. We use water to brush our teeth. We use water to wash our cars. We use water when we cook and when we boil eggs and we do everything else with water. So a lot of people don't really understand where water comes from, but water doesn't just come from the tap. There's a long journey that water makes before it gets to your sink. And so water falls out of the sky from rain and it hits the land. And when it hits the land, that area is called a watershed. And the most healthy watershed is a native forested watershed. So forest, you guys know what that means, but native means that that forest is made up of trees and ferns and small little plants like you see here that are only from Hawaii. And so this kind of a forest is really, really important to having a healthy watershed. It's got what we call a healthy canopy. That's the top, that's the roof of the forest. And that slows the water down. It's got what we call a sub canopy. That's all the trees that are shorter than the tallest trees that also help put shade on the ground. And underneath that, we have a real thick ground cover of ferns and mosses and all of those together, they act like a sponge to hold that water together. And if we didn't have a healthy watershed, what would happen is all of that water would just run off into the ocean. It would make our oceans dirty and brown and we couldn't swim. And we wouldn't be able to harvest that water in streams or underwater with wells so that we could use it to brush our teeth and to drink water every day. So this is an example of a native tree. This is called an ohia tree. And you guys have probably seen these ohia lehua. This is a beautiful yellow, they call them mamo um, in Hawaiian for the yellow tree. But this is just one example of one of the most important trees uh, in a native Hawaiian rainforest in, in a watershed. But one of the big problems today in, in, with our, our native watersheds, our native forests, is that our forests are disappearing. And a lot of them have already, actually already disappeared. So that's because of a lot of reasons. So a lot of the, these forests have burned. A lot of them have been cut down for the development and the houses that we see. And a lot of them just get damaged by animals. We call them feral animals. So those are wild animals that got out of captivity. So they pets, they got loose, farm animals that got loose like pigs, especially in deer and goats. And they go out and they eat these kinds of trees. And once these trees are gone, there's all of these other, what we call non-native invasive plant species that come in. So a big part of my job on the ranch is to try to take out and remove those non-native invasive plants and to replace them with native plants that are healthier watersheds and that are just better for the land. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how one of the ways that we help to rebuild a native forest and a watershed. Cause a lot of these, a lot of these places, they're huge areas. So it's really hard. One of the things we do is we plant trees like you would plant in your yard, but it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time to get something this big up into the mountains. We fly in helicopters and we can't bring a tree like this into the forest. It's just too expensive. So what we've been doing is we've been harvesting koa seeds. So these are koa seed pods that you can see here. And so we just pick these. These, these are a lot like almost like green beans, except they're brown and you pick them. And on the inside, there's a whole set of seeds, kind of like you'd see like peas in a pod. And in here, we take these seeds that are in these pods and we plant them out in the ground, but it's really hard also to plant these seeds directly into the ground because what happens is when you put seeds in the ground, birds will eat them and sometimes they blow away or they dry out if there's no rain. So we started playing around with what we call seed balls. And so we're gonna make seed balls today and I can't wait to work with you guys when we come back and in person, we'll get, this, get to do this together because it's a lot of fun and it actually really helps us uh, protect our watersheds. You know, it, we need to make a lot of seed balls 
to get a lot of forest to come back because um, each tree that you see up on the mountain started with a little tiny seed. So what we do is we take clay. So this is just clay like you see, like you probably do in art class. It's just a piece of clay. And then we take these koa seed pods and this is just one of the species we use a lot because koa is a very important native Hawaiian tree. And so we take those seeds out of the pods and this is what they look like when they're out of the pods. And what we do is we combine the two. And there was a Japanese farmer that came up with this technique and it was just a really cool thing that we started adopting here in our conservation work. You know, one of the things I guess I should really say that I didn't is Water is not important just to us to brush teeth and, and to, you know, to wash our cars and, and for us to be drinking because we got to drink about a half gallon of water every day. It's really, really important. It's key to agriculture. You cannot have agriculture without water and you can't have water without a healthy watershed. So again, the work that we do in land management is directly linked to providing water for agriculture, whether it's on Haleakala Ranch or whether it's a pineapple farmer or some other farmer down farming cabbage. It's really, really important to have a healthy watershed. So again, what we do is it's really simple. It's kind of just like making chocolate, chocolate chip cookies. We take a little bit of clay, we take a little bit of seeds, and we just combine it just like you would do making chocolate, chocolate chip cookies with your teacher or with your mom or with your dad. And we just combine the two. And I'll make a big one just because it's easier for you guys to see but we just roll it together just like that. And you have a seed ball. So this is quite a bit bigger than you'd normally see, but this is a piece of clay with a bunch of native koa seeds that we collected. And so what we do is we'll put these out instead of scattering the seeds on the ground where they might blow away or they might dry out or the rains might not come for like three months. This, the seeds will stay protected in this clay. So you know what happens when clay dries? You probably have done that is it gets hard and that hard shell protects the seeds. And when it rains, maybe two months later, the clay starts to melt away, just like a piece of mud melts away. The seed gets exposed and the seed starts to sprout. And so we just throw these out on the land. You know, we throw it out everywhere and we try to put thousands of these out. And if we get, you know, some small fraction of those, maybe one out of 10 of these seeds actually takes, it's a, it's, it's a really cheap, fast, and really fun way to build a native forest and a native watershed. So we really look forward to you guys coming out and we can do this, we'll make thousands of them. You guys can play, you can get dirty. I really do miss that working with you guys. So we're looking forward to that pretty soon. My name's Jess and I work at the Maui Soil and Water Conservation District and today I'm up here at Haleakala Ranch as a part of the Maui County Farm Bureau Ag in the Classroom. So you might be thinking, well, what do I do? Well my job is to help protect natural resources. Now what's in natural resources? Well we've got all sorts of things like soil, water, air, plants, and animals. But today, we're gonna focus on soil. Now, a lot of you guys probably know soil is dirt, but we scientists call dirt soil because it's actually a lot more than just dirt. Now, what's in soil? Soil is made up of all kinds of things. Lots of things that you see around here today. One of the most important things that's in soil is something called minerals. There are lots of really tiny rocks that come from the earth and make up a big chunk of soil. There's also water in soil. Even if it looks super dry, water is still a really important part of soil. There's also air in soil to fill up all the tiny little gaps. One of the most important things that we address in soil is called organic matter. Now organic matter is basically every living thing you see eventually goes into the dirt. And then when it decomposes and dies, it's reused. 
And that stuff is what gives life to everything you see. From lychee trees, to mango trees, to onions, potatoes, and tomatoes. Just about everything you know relies on soil. So soil is really important. Now, the next thing we're gonna show you guys is why keeping stuff on top of soil is important. Aloha, my name is Sabrina. I'm here at Haleakala Ranch for Maui County Farm Bureau's Ag in the Classroom. Um, so as Jessica mentioned, I'm going to be talking about, um, now that we know a little bit about soil, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what happens when soil interacts with rainfall. So here we have our rainfall simulator. We've got two different types of soil here and what we're going to be looking at is actually erosion. Erosion is the amount of sediment that's coming off the land that's slipping away due to the rainfall that's happening. So we've got two different types of soil. The first one is bare ground. As you can see, there's nothing growing on this soil. It's completely just the soil itself. And the second type of soil we have is called ground cover. So this is soil that has something growing on the top layer of the soil itself and we're gonna go ahead and run the simulators and show you the differences between the two and maybe you can guess which one has more or less erosion. All right, so the way the simulator works is we're gonna um, pour water into this top layer and this little container has holes into it and it's gonna allow rainfall to happen and we're gonna create rainfall and then we're gonna see what happens when the rainfall interacts with our soil. So as you can see, uh, with the soil on the bare ground, the water is easily taking the sediment off of the soil and it's completely silting it off into our container here. Um, and there's lots of sediment and the water is very murky and very brown. Um, so you may be familiar with uh, brown water warnings and this is kind of what happens when that occurs. So our next demonstration is gonna be with this ground cover and we're gonna see what happens when the soil and the grass interacts with the rainfall. So as you can see, as the soil is actually absorbing and creating kind of a filtration for our rainfall, the water comes off pretty clear and the soil isn't being silted off into um, our reef ecosystems and carrying all that sediment and nutrients with it. So now I'm going to be letting Kelly demonstrate a little bit about what makes up our soil and the different components in our soil. Hi, I'm Kelly and I work for the Soil and Water Conservation Districts in Maui County. I'm here to talk about different soil types and demonstrate to you a fun do-it-yourself at-home activity that you can do in your own backyard. There are three main soil types, sand, silt, and clay. Sand is what you find at the beach. It doesn't hold many nutrients and it's coarse and dry. And silt is soft and powdery when it's dry and very slippery when it's wet. Now clay is very hard when it's dry and very sticky when it's wet. For the do-it-yourself at home demonstration, you can do this in your own backyard. All you need is a large jar with a tight lid, such as this, a handful of soil, or more than a handful if you have a large jar, and some water. What you're going to do is pour the water into the jar like this and fill it all the way to the top without overflowing it, of course. Shut the lid tightly and shake it for like two minutes. And you're going to let it sit for about an hour. You'll start to notice it settle a lot sooner than an hour, but you'll start to notice the different layers forming. 
this is what the final product will start to look like after a few hours. You can see the sand sits down at the bottom and the next layer is silt and then another layer above that is clay. Now this is the cloudy water where the clay is still trying to dissolve into the bottom. All of this is dirt and debris. After about 24 hours, the water will turn clear and you'll be able to see the layers forming much clearer. The importance of knowing your soil type in your yard um, is great if you want to grow your own garden or you're just curious about what what can grow in your yard. And that's it for the simple do-it-yourself demonstration. Thank you for joining us at Ag in the Classroom. Hey guys, it's me and I'm back through the soil tunnel. Before I take you in here, I wanna show you what's on top. So just like I was talking about earlier, there's all these important things that soil grows in. We've got everything from crops, like these carrots here, everything you can find grown for food to eat. Then over here, we've got some forest land, just like all the trees you see up here today. And then we've got our water or the ocean, just like you see down there. So everything you see is always around us. We've also got our pasture land, just like we're up here today. This is where all the cows and animals feed and forage. And everything inside this soil tunnel is based a part of our ecosystem. So the next time we're with you guys, you can take a crawl through the tunnel with us. Bye for now. Hello, my name is Eric. I'm the coordinator for the Master Gardener program at the University of, of Hawaii Maui College. Um, obviously, we're all about plants, and today I'm going to talk to you about canoe plants, which leads us to the question is, what is a canoe plant? Obviously, not a plant made from a canoe, but it has to do with the Hawaiians who first arrived here. Actually, they were Polynesians, they weren't Hawaiians yet, who brought plants and seeds with them in their canoes. Original voyagers came here from the Marquesa Islands about 2,000 years ago. So they've been here quite a long time. They didn't bring much with them. They had to make do with fish and birds and whatever local plants they could find on the island. But the second group from the Society Islands, they brought plants and seeds with them to uh, improve their life. They didn't know what to expect when they got here. They brought approximately 27 plants and seeds with them. They also brought pigs and dogs and rats and jungle birds and all sorts of different animals like that to populate the island with. Obviously the Polynesians at that point didn't have much. There wasn't a Walmart and there wasn't a Home Depot and there wasn't a food land. So they had to make or eat everything. They had to grow on their own. Um, and they had no metal. There's no ore here for making metal tools. So if you think about it, all they had was wood and stone and they had to make everything else or grow it the only thing they could catch was fish. When they got here, they discovered very fertile soil, a mild climate, big forests, lots of fish, very, very rich, abundant food supply from all the plants that they grew. So the Hawaiians flourished and probably became one of the best Polynesian groups in terms of islanders that existed. The plants they brought with them, the guess, best guess is about 27 different plants is on this list here. A lot of them you've seen today. A lot of them are still currently in agriculture, are still being used. And when I go through them, you'll, you'll be able to recognize them. You'll see them in food land or growing on the side of the road. The first plant I want to talk about is Kalo. Everybody knows it as taro. This was probably one of their most used food sources. Um, we all know it as poi, right? 
but the leaves are edible too. You can cook these just like spinach. Okay, so they use the entire plant. Um, in Aloy, where they would grow um, all the, t the uh, taro, one acre would provide three to five tons of poi per year, which is a lot of food. And you've all seen, because of the kanaka maoli, they used to gather to eat in a circle and they would make a poi bowl in the center. And depending upon how tart the poi was, it could be one finger, two finger, or three finger, depending upon how good it was. It's also medicinal, okay? They had no doctors or any of that sort of thing along the way. So they used to use it to settle your stomach. Um, they'd mix it with other things and treat boils and diarrhea and use it as a poultice on cuts and wounds. Um, it's a very, very useful plant. They never wasted any of it. This is a tree called Kamani. It's a very tall tree. It grows about 60 feet. They obviously had to use stone implements, which made it very difficult to utilize, and it being a very hard wood. But they made canoes. They made home parts. They made calabashes out of it, which are the big poi bowls. They made food bowls, trays, utensils, just about anything out of it. The beauty of the Kamani is it has no bad taste or odor, so it's perfect for food. It didn't translate any taste into the food that they put in it. And they also used the flowers for making lei. Inside the nut, there's a kernel that they could take out and it was oily. And the oil was used in a lamp. You could actually burn it and it was used to light things at night. Also the fruit you had an extract that they could make a dye out of to color their tapa cloths. Everybody's seen the kukuis. Every time you go into the uh, parking lot at, at uh, the mall, you run over the nuts. Uh, you can see they have very beautiful flowers. Um, it's also a very tall tree, about 50 feet. They made all the same kind of wood products out of this that they used to um, out of the Kamani tree. And it also has a, a lot of oil in the fruit. Um, they used to use it for, for uh, lamps. They made dye with it. Um, what they used to do is take the nuts and they'd stick them in a row on a coconut frond and then stick the coconut frond in the ground and light one at a time. That one would burn out, they'd light the next one, literally. And the responsibility of children, in other words, you guys, if you were Hawaiians living at that time period, were responsible for keeping the candle lit. What they, would, they also had another thing, they would roast the kernels and the fishermen would pulverize them. And when they were out fishing, they were looking for fish. And if it was wavy, bumpy, and they couldn't see where the fish were, they put that pulverized oil on it and it acted like a piece of glass. The film for it made the visibility better so they could actually see the fish. Hawaiians were very smart people. Everybody knows what these are, tea leaves, also called key. Okay, those are used still nowadays. They're used in religious ceremonies. You've seen these everywhere. The Hawaiians use them as a roof thatch to keep the rain out. Of course, lau lau, we all know what that's for. <laughs> uh, they used them as wrappers for food, for storage. Coal, sugar cane. We all know what this is. We've seen it come and go on the island for many years. The Hawaiians were very smart. They grew 40 different varieties of, of sugar cane. They used it to sweeten some of the medicines. And of course, you guys all know Haupia and Kololo. It's still being used the same as it was 2,000 years ago. Okay, Ma'ia, banana. Everybody knows bananas, you see them everywhere. The Hawaiians had 50 different varieties of banana. They grew everywhere. They considered them slow growth and it was a, a take on patience. If you can grow a banana tree, you're considered a patient person. Of all these varieties, women were allowed to only eat two of them. And believe it or not, if they ate one of the other 48 varieties and were caught, it was kapu. They were put to death. Can you believe that? Yes. Yes, that didn't change until the 1800s. Next plant, milo. A smaller tree, only about 40 feet tall. All the wood products, utensils, furnishings, jewelry. The Milo wood itself is incredibly beautiful, so it was only for chiefs. Only the chiefs got to use Milo. You had to be special. The bark is also used for cordage. You could make a rope with it. Also dyes, oils, medicine, and gum. Noni, 
can see the little green fruit on there. It's primarily medicinal. Okay, it was used for all sorts of different things. Diabetes, heart problems, high blood pressure, wounds. You'd be surprised, but it has a lousy taste. So we know what to do with that, right? Go straight to the sugar cane. They used to sweeten it with that. They considered it the aspirin of the ancients. Good stuff. Ulu. You all know it as breadfruit, but actually that's a misnomer. It's an, actually a high carbohydrate vegetable that grows on a tree. Yes, yes. Um, you can treat it like a potato. You can bake it, you can fry it, you can grill it, you can stuff it. There's all sorts of good things with it. It's a very, very high carbohydrate vegetable um, that everybody likes. The wood is very lightweight, so they used to make drums, surfboards, poi boards, all sorts of different lightweight things out of it. Next on the list is Uala, also known as sweet potato. The Hawaiians used to grow 200 different varieties of these things. These and the um, poi were their main source of starch, believe it or not. You can see how easy. This one came sitting on the counter and it sprouted. All you have to do is cut it in half, stick it in the ground, and away it goes. I've been planting these in the garden out, to, out at the college down there. And if you cut one of these in half and stick it in the ground and give it about two months, it produces 10 to 15 pounds of potatoes. Yeah. And it has no care at all. You don't have to do anything except water it. So very, very smart. Okay. And last on the list of what I have with me today is avapuhi. You guys know it as red ginger. Okay. You see it everywhere. It's turned into quite a commercial plant. Ginger is picked up by everybody everywhere. Um, the ginger itself, believe it or not, when the flowers bloom inside the top of the flower, it gets this gooey, sticky kind of a mess. It makes a great shampoo and conditioner. The Hawaiians used to use it to wash their hair and it's still used nowadays. If smart people who know when they see a red ginger flower, scoop it out, rub it in your hair. Um, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I'm sure you guys have seen how important plants from 2000 years ago are important to agriculture now. Bananas, sweet potatoes, the flowers, the breadfruit, all of those things we still use um, that are so important to us even after all this much time. Um, thanks for joining us at Ag in the Classroom. Have a good day. I'm a farmer at Bayer here in Maui and I like to grow plants. So today we're going to talk about the different parts of a plant and what we do with them. So first off I have some seedlings here and one of these seedlings um, we're going to kind of take a look and see how can you tell what this plant is. So I'm going to open it up and actually look and try to see if I can get a clue based on the seed that I can find in here. And there we go. So I've opened it up and I've found this seed. It's actually a little popcorn seed. So corn is, is, a, is a seed that we can eat. Coconut is obviously a big seed that we can eat. Everything is bottled up in this tiny little seed is what the plant needs for food and all the information to make a brand new plant. So each one of these little kernels can become a whole new plant. So seeds are, are also pretty cool because plants use them to try and scatter it around. So if the plant just doesn't want to stay in one spot, it wants to spread all over the, all over the place. So we've got things like dandelions that um, blow on the wind and scatter their seeds. And then also things like sticker burrs, which we all don't like to have in our, in our farms and gardens, but, um, but those stick to animals and people and those actually spread their seeds around that way. Um, and so, People have studied plants and done things like, hey, why do these stickers stick to my clothes so well? Let's study it and figure out how we can copy it and make something like, like Velcro, where it's got these tiny little pokey sides which mimic the burr, and then also the kind of fuzzy side that mimics your shirt or like a, um, an animal's fur. So the next part of the plant, after the seed starts to grow, is you can see these tiny little white roots sticking out there. 
And um, did you know that we can actually eat roots too? So things like a sweet potato or a carrot um, are things that are, um, that are roots that, that you can eat. But the cool thing ab about roots is there's actually different kinds of roots. So, um, so this, these little white roots are, um, like, are called fibrous roots and they kind of generally just stay near the surface and kind of help the plant um, you know, gather water near the surface. But in times of drought when there's not much water, you might have a plant that grows a big tap root like this to go down deep and make sure that it can find water when it needs it. So one of the things that we do um, on a farm is we try to conserve water by using drip line that takes water right to the right to the roots. So there's actually tiny little holes in here and that brings water right to that plant so we're not wasting any water um, and not growing anything like weeds. If we just spray water everywhere, you might have a lot more weeds. And we actually turn that water on and off in the field with these automated irrigation controllers they're actually solar powered so it's a pretty cool way to kind of use the the sun to to help us water the crops so the next part of the plant after the roots if you take a look at our plant here the roots grow um, grow down but then something else grows up so what grows up up is shoots, brah, right? So it's our, it's our stem of the plant or the shoot of the plant that grows up. And um, we can eat lots of different kinds of stems, right? So there's um, asparagus, celery, those are some stems that you might, you might have eaten before. But the stem does some pretty cool things for the plant. It helps the plant kind of stand up straight and it also is a way that the plant can kind of reach up and get to the sun. One thing that I didn't talk about with the roots is that they're in the ground helping Helping the plant get water, right? They're bringing water and nutrients up from the from the ground, and then the stem is trying to transport it up to the rest of the plant. So. Um, there's some tiny little tubes inside each stem. One is called xylem, which actually brings all of that water and nutrients up through the roots and up into the rest of the plant. And then there's something called phloem, which goes down from the leaves back down to the rest of the plant. And it's actually transporting all of the sugar or the food that the plant needs um, through a process called photosynthesis. So this is... Um, a really important part of our of our plant, uh, but once you have your 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 stem, you might start noticing some things sh um, shooting off the side. Some of these little leaves that shoot off the side. We can eat leaves like kale and cabbage. Those leaves are are like these big solar panels trying to hang out there and saying, "Hey, give us all of the energy from the sun. We're gonna." take that energy and we're gonna convert it into um, food for the plant. So we talked about the, the stem that's helping us reach up to get to the sun. The, the leaves are actually what is capturing that sunlight. And you might notice that a lot of leaves are green in color and that's because plants use their leaves um, to capture sunlight. They have a thing called chlorophyll, which is the green, what makes plants look green. And that chlorophyll, the plant uses a process called photosynthesis to convert energy from the sun and carbon dioxide and water into food for the plant and also produces oxygen for us. You can actually kind of see this if you want to try it at home. You can take a leaf off of a, off of a plant, take a leaf off of a plant and put it in a jar of water and um, leave it in the sun for a couple of hours and you'll actually be able to see tiny little air bubbles, tiny little oxygen that's coming out of little holes in the leaf called stomata. When we exhale like this, we're breathing out carbon dioxide that that plant can use to turn into food for itself and the plant says thank you. It uses it for food and then it gives us oxygen. So, so we can say, Thanks plants for all the oxygen, right? So if you can believe it, this plant is only nine days old. So can you imagine growing uh, four or five inches in nine days? Like if you guys could, could grow that fast, I mean, you'd be like on the basketball team, you'd be 10 feet tall in no time. It's pretty cool how fast plants can grow. And that, in fact, on the farm, we use, um, we use bamboo as a windbreak because it grows so fast and it grows so tall that it helps us to, to protect crops from winds when it's really windy days so after the leaves our plants start to grow flowers and you can actually eat flowers too this is kind of a uh, one that maybe you don't think about a whole lot but broccoli and cauliflower um, are flowers that you eat but also there's some other edible flowers that you might see on cakes and things sometimes but always ask a grown-up before you um, try a flower um, to make sure it's one that's that's edible or not but with flowers flowers are beautiful and they have um, they are a way to that the plant can attract um, 
insects to help with pollination. So the flowers are the reproductive part of the plant. And, um, and you can kind of see all the, the beautiful colors, this red and yellow um, big parts here. That's the petals of the flower. That's, we're pretty familiar with that. This green part, the base that kind of goes in there, that's actually um, called a sepal. And that, uh, that just kind of holds the, the flower together. But the reproductive parts are the, the parts on the top here. So you can see the tiny little yellow um, anthers kind of shooting off the sides there. That actually has pollen on it. Those are the, the tips are the stamen. So that stamen has the pollen and the pistil is where that pollen has to go to make a good pollination and start making seeds for this plant. So the, the cool part about this is like, well, how does that get there on its own? I mean, the flower doesn't have arms. It can't, it can't make that pollination. So it basically uses things like the wind. You can kind of see the wind blowing. Um, the wind will blow pollen from those little stamen onto the pistil. Um, and then also things like bees and butterflies are called pollinators. They come and they say, hey, I really want some, some nectar. That's really good food for me. And on their way to get nectar from the pistil, they bump into the stamen and get a lot of pollen on their, on their wings and on their body. And then when they get into that uh, pistil to get their, their nectar, they're actually bringing the pollen and it makes a pollination for that plant. So everything in nature is working together um, to kind of uh, keep, keep us going. So after that pollen happens um, the, the last part of the plant is the fruit um, and so we have some examples of fruit here um, which our plant there is still too young to, to have fruit on it um, but you can think of things like apples and oranges that's that's an easy thing to think of um, for fruit but did you know that things like tomatoes and avocados are actually fruit as well they have a seed inside which makes them the fruit part of the plant but fruit is the part of the plant that has the seed inside and so this is actually another way that that plants can spread spread their seed around because an animal or people come by and want to eat that fruit and now that seed gets moved to a new location plus a little manure fertilizer that can help that plant get started growing. So it's, a, it's another unique way for, um, for plants to spread their seeds around um, and, and start making new plants. So um, one thing that, that's also kind of interesting about, uh, about plants, and this is one thing that farmers like to do as well, is there's different ways that plants spread their seeds, but, but there's also different ways that farmers can um, can propagate plants and one of those ways is through cuttings so a banana like this is called a Cavendish banana it's a little bit different than the apple bananas that we also grow here in Hawaii but these Cavendish bananas are grown all over the world and they're so cool because every single one of these Cavendish bananas is actually all from the same original plant so basically the first plant grew and they said this is a great banana I want to share it with somebody they cut a piece off planted it in a new location and now that plants growing and healthy and they cut off a piece of that one and give it to the next place. And so for years and years and years, these have spread all over the world. And that is why every banana that you eat looks and tastes pretty much exactly the same because it's actually all the same plant. So just to recap, we have um, all of the parts of our plant. It started from a tiny seed and it grew some roots down through the soil. And then we had a stem that shot up and it started growing some leaves. And after the leaves, we saw some flowers start coming out and the bees popped pollinated those flowers and then we got some fruit growing and in that fruit is another seed to start a new plant. One of the things that you can do if you want to learn more about plants is find a seed, plant it in your garden and, and start growing it and start exploring. In fact, my kids and I, we took some popcorn seeds like these planted in our backyard, just a handful of seeds, and we were able to get two big bowls of popcorn out of it. So I had a lot of fun talking to you guys today. Um, thanks for joining us. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Shana Decker and I'm happy to be here at the Maui County Farm Bureau's Ag in the Classroom field trip. At Hawaiian Electric, we, it's our job to make sure that everybody has power or electricity. We provide service to your schools, your homes, your neighborhoods, to power lights, run TVs and computers, and to keep your food cold in your refrigerator. At Hawaiian Electric, we like to provide power with energy to your homes and schools, and you can power your bodies with healthy energy too. We're going to talk a bit about that today, as well as how to stay safe with your family when you're out picking that healthy fruit. So in Maui County, we're so lucky, we're so fortunate to grow our own fruits and vegetables. We have an ideal climate, a beautiful place, 
where we can grow all of our healthy fruits and vegetables. And so at Hawaiian Electric, we really want to just remind people to stay safe when they're out there harvesting fruit. A lot of times fruits can grow on trees and we know that trees can grow up really, really high. And sometimes you might see them get close to the power lines, which is how electricity gets to our homes and schools. So if you take a look here at Uncle, he's up there and he's looking at that tree and maybe he sees that juicy ripe mango. We gotta have to remind Uncle before he picks the fruit, Uncle, make sure you look up, around, and through the trees to make sure there's no power lines nearby. And that's because electricity loves to travel and electricity can travel through these power lines. So if Uncle gets his fruit picker too close to the power lines, that electricity can connect with that fruit picker down through Uncle and back down to the ground. And Uncle, we want him to stay safe. So if you see Uncle or a family member when you're picking fruit and there's a power line nearby, we could just tell Uncle, hey what, you know what, let's go to another tree and make sure that we have a safe place to pick our fruit. Another thing to keep in mind is to plant the right tree in the right place. You know, there was a day last summer when my kids and I, we took a papaya and we had some seeds. And so we planted it in a pot and we wanted to grow our own papaya tree. So little did we know that a little sprout came up in our pot and it was this tiny, right? So a cakey plant. But we have to always remember that that cakey tree will one day grow up really big. So before we planted our papaya tree in the ground, I just reminded my kids, hey, make sure we look up around, make sure there's no power lines nearby because one day that baby tree will grow up to be a big healthy tree. And so that's just something to keep in mind when you're planting your own tree in the right place. We're working to power our islands with clean, healthy energy, and that's renewable energy like wind or solar power. And you can power your bodies with healthy energy too, with local fruits and vegetables grown right here on our islands. Our islands have fruits and vegetables that have a lot of healthy vitamins and things to keep us strong and smart and ready to go about our day. So things like pineapple, strawberries, they all come from our island. And things that we can kind of keep in mind is always to be observant about what the plants and fruit look like and where, where they come from. So we're gonna play a little game here and if you can follow along with me, we talked about a papaya tree. So papayas, a lot of times when you look at different trees, you can always notice that the type of leaves they have are gonna give you the hint to the type of fruit they are. So when you think of a papaya plant or a papaya tree, I kind of think that they have leaves like crowns. So which tree do you think would be the tree with the papaya fruit? Would it be the one with a brown coconut growing on it? I don't think so. How about the one with this little banana thing coming out? Would that be the one? No, I think it's the one that looks just like this with the crown leaves. Another one we have here that grows right here is strawberries. And so strawberries, when you look and you observe, you can often see a strawberry plant has yellow flowers on it. So can you find the plant that has the yellow flower on it? And that would be right here. And so just one more, just for fun. You know, my kids love bananas. We can grow them right here on our islands on Maui, Molokai and Lanai. So what kind of plant or what kind of tree would come from a banana? Would it grow on the ground, do you think? Or would it grow on a tree? I think it might grow just right here and it gives us hints as to what kind of plant and or tree it is. So I really thank you guys for having us here at this virtual field trip. Field trip. We Please hope to see you soon in person next time where you can enjoy some fresh Kula Country Farm strawberries and Maui Gold pineapples. Stay safe, take care, and we'll see you next time. Hi, my name is Greg Friel. We're here at Haleakala Ranch and uh, we're filming for the Ag in the Classroom program that's sponsored by Maui Farm Bureau. Um, I'm the livestock manager here at Haleakala Ranch. Uh, I've been here since 1994. One of the big things I brought here when I came here was the use of stock dogs. They had never used stock dogs in the past and uh, all throughout my career when I started out in the late 70s we always, the ranches I worked on, we always used stock dogs to help us move livestock around. So um, I'd just like to show you a little bit of what these dogs are capable of doing. This is Trev, he's about two and a half years old. He's a border collie that I had 
picked up out of Australia when he was about eight months old. And um, he was started enough to know that he would work. And then, you know, he had very, very little training, but with the breeding that he had, he, he did have the, the genetics to, to be a working dog. And so I saw the filming of him uh, working a little bit as an eight month old pup. And then I bought him and shipped him over and then we worked with him from there. These animals, whether it's cattle or whether it's sheep, you know, they're herding animals and it makes it a whole lot easier for you to move them if they're in a herd and you can keep them together and trail them wherever you need to, whether you're moving pastures or getting them to a corral to do some processing or something. So um, just a little bit of like the basics would be something like this. Trev, come. Trev. Stand. So we'll put them in a corner like that. So over. So initially you just put them back and forth, teaching them what that word means. So that word over means for, hey, over means for them to go counterclockwise here. is for them to go clockwise. So when they're young like this, you're just teaching them in a pen like this so that they understand that word means that direction. Here, at, hey at, at, at. So growling at them is kind of their, a punishment for them to react and get back into the corner. You know, it's not about the corner, but it's all about the corners. In the beginning, the corner is a place for them to settle down, think things through. He's an older dog, so he wants to just get in there and start working well. He's got to stop and think and put some brain work into it and not just be coming around and trying to move, move the stock around. Walk. Stand. Here. Up. Here, up, stand, over, stand, here, there, stand, over, over, there, stand, here, there, up, up, there, walk, stand, here, up, stand, stand, here, Ah, stand, here, there, walk, stand, stand, get behind, get behind, here, there, stand, Trev, stand, oh, there, ah, up there, here, up there, here, stand, over, there, stand. Like the command there, they'll start on a, off on a direction. When you tell them there, they're supposed to lock right, right in and face up on the herd that they're working. And so like when you're trailing them someplace, you can place that dog out, you can send them out and you can place them someplace on the clock that will turn them in whatever direction you want them to go. Load up, load up. When they're pups, we'll start them off on these buckets and it's just a case of they're at ground zero and then you know, you, you walk away because puppies, when you, when you get in them bonding to you, you walk away, they want to follow you and whatnot, <clears throat> but they're supposed to stay on that bucket and they're not supposed to move. And so until you call them, <clears throat> and then when they get used to staying on the bucket, then you use the stimulus, the animals as a stimulus where they will go around and the dog is still supposed to stay on that bucket. <clears throat> if they jump down, 
you, you growl at them, punish them, get them back on top, and they realize that that is where they're supposed to be. That's when they, you know, that's when they'll get their praise. If they jump down and run away, you scold them and put pressure on them till they get back up on top and they find out that that's a safety zone. <clears throat> the reason why you do it up there and not on the ground is they make a move, they get down, it's very obvious. If they're down on the ground <clears throat> and they crawl up five feet, ten, six feet, you know, 12 inches, you don't notice it right away. <clears throat> Excuse me, but when they get off of the bucket, you know right away what's happening. Trev. Walk, stand. Ah, 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 over. Trev, over. Trev, over. Stand. Ah, ah, over. Ah, over. There. Here. There. Over. There. Trev. There. Stand. Walk. Stand. Load up. He gets wound up working sheep because they're too, they're a small animal. You know, he's got to show a lot more respect when he's working cattle, especially cows and calves or bulls or something. But he gets wound up and racing around and it's, he needs to be disciplined. He, he's got to be straightened up and, and set straight to, you know, slow down and rate himself. But it's not for children audiences. Okay. There. Walk. Stand. Here. Stand. There. Stand. Walk. Stand. Ah, Trev, stand. Ah. Stand. Over. At. At. Stand. Over. There. Here. Here. There. Here. At. Here. There. At. Over. There. Here. Hey, here, there. Ah, ah, there, here, there, over, there, here, there, over, there, walk. Ah, 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 there. Here, there, over, there, load up, good boy. So basically that's, you know, how you start. If you get them working in a small pen like this, then you start moving out to bigger pens and then going out into the field. And, you know, in fact, you know, the, the young pups, you start them off in an even smaller, smaller pen, about 16 foot by 16 foot. Then you bring them into something like this, that's about 40 by 40. And then you progress on to a bigger this corral. This is some and of the jobs out, that you out know, in these the pasture stock working. dogs can help us with. Like I say, you know, we use horses to help us gather. We use the dogs to help us gather livestock. Find a job that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Thank you.